What's cooking, everybody? Episode 57 of the Slipping Weed Podcast coming right at you. Uh, first thing I want to get into this week is uh, Jose Ramirez's comeback win after losing to Josh Taylor. Unanimous decision win over Jose Pedraza. Um, this fight, you know, in my mind, this was a real 50-50 fight coming in. Ramirez is coming off not only a loss, but a loss, you know, where the stakes are the absolute highest they can be in boxing, you know, an undisputed fight. And, you know, for some guys that might be a big enough letdown that's that it's difficult to come back from that. You know what I mean? Um, and Pedraza, you know, winning several fights in a row, beats Julian Rodriguez, undefeated 21-0 fighter in his last fight. You know, he's riding a certain level of momentum, a certain level of positive momentum. Um, so, but, you know, as a whole, if I'm looking at the totality of their careers, Ramirez is probably, I, I, I was leaning towards Ramirez, but as the fight got closer, I thought, you know, Pedraza's boxing skills could really give him a difficult time. Uh, and I think in a lot of ways they did, but the way I saw the fight was kind of the first eight rounds. I think I had it five to three for Pedraza. I just thought he was boxing real nice. He was picking his spots um, when he needed to. Once he switched southpaw, it created some new angles for him. Uh, but down the stretch, it felt like Ramirez turned it up one more gear, like great fighters do, and really out-hustled Pedraza, and Pedraza didn't offer enough offense back. You know, even if Ramirez threw six punches and landed one, if Pedraza doesn't answer, you know, Ramirez wins that exchange. And I thought Ramirez clearly won the last four rounds, you know, so regardless of how close you had it for the first eight, I thought, you know, Ramirez very obviously um, pulled ahead at the end of the fight. This is a great matchup. And, and part of why it's impressive for Ramirez is because Pedraza is a really good fighter. He's really technical. He's very slippery, very difficult to tag clean, and has only lost to the absolute, you know, best in the sport in his weight neighborhood. So for Ramirez, this is a really good win because this is a this is a tricky fight, right? This is a, a slippery guy that switches stances, coming off of a big loss. You know, this had it, this could have been like a trap fight almost, you know what I mean? But Ramirez just responded um, at every moment that he needed to and pulled out, you know, a relatively close decision. I think all the judges had it 8-4. I had it 7-5. You know, I was talking to my man Gabe uh, Morales during the fight. He had it 10-2. You know, I could see that because there was a lot of close rounds where if there wasn't that much offense coming from Pedraza. But, you know, I just felt like his work was super clean in the first half, middle portion of the fight. But the response from Ramirez was a championship response. And uh, I think, obviously, sooner or later, the belts will get vacated. And, you know, I talked about this last week. I would love to see Ramirez and Catterall. I would love to see a rematch between Ramirez and Zapata. I would love to see Ramirez versus Progre. There's a lot of good matchups at 140 for Jose Ramirez. And I also think that the idea of him going up to welterweight and Josh Taylor going up to welterweight, um, maybe even having a rematch at welterweight at some point in the maybe near future. Um, you know, Ramirez responded the way you want a great fighter to respond from a loss. And so now the sky's the limit for him. You know what I'm saying? This is, this is, the, this is the response you want to see. The other major fight this weekend that I wanted to talk about was uh, – Roman Chocolatito Gonzalez winning a dominant, dominant decision over Julio Cesar Martinez. You know, we're watching an all-time great with this guy, with Chocolatito. We're really watching an all-time great fighter, not just smaller, you know, bantamweight and under fighter. We're watching an all-time legend. And part of why we're watching an all-time legend is not just because he was amazing in this fight you know what I'm saying because he was but it's that if anything he's better than he was 
six, seven years ago, six years ago before the losses to Sorong Vasai. Like, he, if anything, he's better now. And he's 34 years old. I remember a lot of Chocolatito fights where defense was sort of an afterthought. And now I feel like he's become such an efficient offensive fighter, you know, while also being extremely difficult to hit. Which I don't know if he was always extremely difficult to hit, but now everything is so thoughtful and computed. Like he's he's just assessing but there's not he doesn't get on the back foot and box. He doesn't do any of that. Everything is the pace is straight ahead. He's coming at you. But there's just a calculated way where he does it, where he's got his feet in the right place. He's got his hands for his defense in the right place. He moves his head a little more now than he used to. I just I think he's a more well-rounded fighter right now than he's ever been. You know, the loss to Estrada was a real flip a coin kind of fight to me. You know, so obviously that's the 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 third fight with Estrada is is what I want to see next. That's what was supposed to happen in this fight. Um but I really this this guy's a fucking legend. This guy's a fucking legend. And you know, whatever he does for the the remainder of his career, it's hard to put a cap on when he's going to retire right now because he's still he still has so much to offer. He still brings so much to the table. You know, I think he could beat Sorbrung Vasai if they fought again. I think when you look back at the context of the of that third fight, you know he the the fight before the first Sorong Vasai fight was with Carlos Quadras. If you haven't seen that fight, that's a brutal fight, and Chocolatito took a lot of punishment in that fight, a lot of punishment. They both did, but there was you know in rounds Chocolatito won, but I remember the amount of punches he was taking. I was just like, fuck, man. This is a lot. Follow that up, and I was there for this fight. His first fight was Sorong Vasai. He's got headbutts. He's got cuts. The fight is fucking brutal. He probably won it, and then they give it to Sorong Vasai. So going into that rematch, he's coming off of two fucking brutal fights. And he was also one of those guys that was always fighting regular, you know, three, four times a year. So that was he just had a lot of wear on him. And sometimes when you have that kind of wear on you, you have an off night. Maybe you have an off night against a great fighter. Maybe you don't have an off night and the other guy has a great night and you don't have the juice to respond, whatever. But he didn't have it, that, that second Sol Rungvisai fight. And since then, he's built himself back up. He's beaten several quality opponents, Calify, um, and now Martinez. The classic second fight with Estrada. I just think that we're, we're watching a legendary, you know, Manny Pacquiao-like career. He's not at that level, but he's like one one cut under. He's really pretty amazing. And particularly if he was to move up to 118 before he calls it and fights, you know, either Inouye or Donaire or one of those guys, I mean, that would just be... Regardless of the result, that would just be legendary. Then then we're talking about him with the Manny Pacquiao's. Um, so, big ups to Chocolatito, man. Hopefully we get to see the third fight with Estrada sooner than later. Um, so, with that, my guest this week is Harry Gigliotti. Harry the Hitman Gigliotti. My co-commentator for... My other co-commentator for the Down and Dirty card that I commentated... Uh, in February, a few weeks back, he's uh, the first boxer to ever win in the Triller Triad, which we'll talk about more and we'll explain more what that is. And um, he's a really smart guy. He's got a real sense of, you know, the business and, and his value and his worth. And I have a lot of respect for, you know, how he looks at the game. And he, he drops, you know, some some nice little nuggets on me during this. So. With that, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Harry Gigliotti.
brother. How you been? I've been good, my brother. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you, man. Um, go ahead, introduce yourself. I always like to let people just introduce themselves. You know what I mean? Yep. Let, let everybody yep. know the accolades and accomplishments. And of course, yeah. I'm uh, Harry the Hitman Gigliotti. I'm fighting at a Lawtown Boxing Club. Um, I'm from Haverhill, Massachusetts. I am the first ever Triller Triad boxing boxer to win inside the Triad Combat. Um, I'm also the inaugural um, Merrimack Valley New England champion of the 147 welterweight division and uh, 2019 New England Knockout of the Year. Yeah. That's awesome, bro. So what talk to me a little bit about the the triad experience. Explain a little bit more Ooh. what that is and like the the rules and, and how that works. All right. Yeah. So basically it's like dirty boxing, more like Muay Thai style clinching and stuff, working inside, engaging inside the clinch. Um, it's basically like a 50-50 equal playing field for boxers and MMA fighters. Um, because boxers, you know, want to control the distance and uh, work off the jab and set their punches up from the outside as the MMA guy wants to cut the distance off so he can get inside and get the clinch. Um, in a triangle, there's not much space for a boxer to move. So, you know, having an equilateral 60 degree, 60 degree, 60 degree, you can trap the boxer in the corners. Now, I made the adjustments, luckily, in the second or third round because um, the first I got clipped a couple of times. Um, and I think it, I, I think from the experience, the MMA guys have the leverage because they throw those big overhands and they, they, they find those shots and you're wearing eight ounce gloves, but these aren't like eight ounce boxing gloves where you can, you know, you've got the padding and you can play a lot of defense and catching and shooting and working the parrying wise. Um, you got to keep your hands like out here, probably like five, six inches away from your face. So you can catch the shots from out there. You know what I mean? Cause, uh, the, the MMA guys want to wing those big overhands and uh, make it make it a dirty fight. Um, there is rules that um, that kind of play into the MMA guys, like you can hammer fist, uh, spinning back fist, and Superman punch. Um, I wouldn't do it out of that because you know I I stick to my traditional boxing. But there was a couple times where I was thinking, you know. Should I throw a spin in back fist? Should I mix it up a little bit? You know what I mean? Like, like a piece of me. I think as I, as I, cause they actually called me back. I'm going to be, I'm going to be fighting in June. They're going to have the next one in June. Um, we're just working on some of the logistics right now. Um, but I, I want to start mixing it up. So I'm going to be working with a lot of uh, Muay Thai guys. I've been in talks with Kelvin Cater, which he's a, a UFC fighter uh, in the top five right now. He fought uh, Max Holloway for the, um, I think it was the 147 UFC champion. What was it? I think Walter weight, no lightweight, the lightweight belt. Um, and then Rob font, who's a featherweight and he's on the rise too. He's in like the top three right now. So I, I I'm going to have a good camp for that. Um, and I'm going to strategize on more working inside and, and, uh, getting out, getting controlling the distance and, um, having to work inside and, and, uh, putting that pressure on me and things like that just trying to uh, have them cut me off and, and uh, work more of that Muay Thai dirty boxing style. Um, Cause it's different. It's not like boxing at all. Is there Boxer, kicks and elbows and shit like that? No, no, no. But I think it's going to evolve at some point. I'm assuming they're going to start adding, adding more and more shit to it. You know what I mean? You can only, you can, I mean, it's, it's a new sport, brand new sport. So they've only had one fight. Um, but as they're bringing guys along, like I've heard, uh, talks of Anderson Silva wanting to get involved, um, Vitor right. Belfort, Chad, Vitor Belfort and Chad Dawson, Dawson fighting, which is going to be a great fight. Um, and then, I mean, Kubrat Polev knocking out Frank Mayer. Now he's fighting Junior Del Santos. I think, you know, Frank Mayer was more of a wrestler. That's his style. I think with Junior Del Santos being more of a, a, a Muay Thai style jujitsu fighter, I think this will work a little more to the MMA guy's benefit, but it should be interesting because a heavy hand like Kubrat Polev changes the whole dynamic of the fight. You know what I mean? Like, so there's a lot of things how, how I'm kind of foreshadowing it, how it could go. But, um, you know, the boxing team has got a good, good, uh, good team this time. And I think, uh, we're looking like we might definitely pull this out. So, 
So is the way that it's oh, it's is it's team versus let, MMA. Box, it's team involved. Yeah, so it's okay. and it, so it's it's three points, uh, three points to win. One point if it's a draw. Obviously, both team gets a point, and then it's five points a knockout. So the knockout is huge if you if you get that. And we we lost the MMA guys because they had two stop three stoppages. I think no two. So it kind of didn't really play into our our hand. Let alone they they had a couple stepping stones uh, on on the boxing team, and they had a lot more of like prospects on the MMA team. So it was kind of like between the veterans, the prospects, there was more. I'd say there was more veterans and stepping stones than there was prospects. I'd like to see them start bringing up more prospects in the sport. You know what I mean? Like, like people that, you know, the, the equal, like make it a 50, 50 drive. All right. There shouldn't be a side B side fights, especially to a new sport that you're trying to sell. This is marketing. You know what I mean? You got to make it 50, 50 draws. So people right. are attracted to it and they want to see it because if, if you're watching some guy, like the club shows, they're made for, for a sides to get built up for the B against B sides to become, you know, a bigger name in the, in the, in, in a bigger promotion. It's pretty much like middleman. you know what I mean? You go to club shows, you expect to see a side versus B side fights. Um, once in a while, like we saw uh, two weeks ago, you see, uh, you know, a big a side get knocked the fuck out. It happens, yeah. but it's rare. It's rare. It's rare. And that was a great knockout, by the way, I forget the guy's name. Um, but that was that was very interesting to see. Um, but yeah, it. I like MMA and I like how UFC works. Um, you know their promotion because they make it more 50-50 fights rather than like a huge A side against like a small B side. I don't know. It levels out the play field. I think it's partly because in the MMA culture, losing the O is not so precious. Whereas in the yeah. culture, it's a it's a big part of the uh, marketing to keep that of, on the end of your record. Of course, I think Mayweather kind of created that too. Uh, that that um, you know people people assume now like you, you have to have a perfect record or you're not going to have that Mayweather career. I think that's the biggest fear for Ryan Garcia right now is is the big question mark. Am I ready for the top five right now? Am I ready to be a contender? Am I ready to be a champion eliminator? So a lot of people are like, you know, why is he, why is he saying he's got mental, mental problems and stuff? He probably is having a mental breakdown because he's like, holy shit, this whole facade of me being this great, great boxer is sooner or later going to get exposed when I have to fight Juravante Davis or Lomachenko, a guy with more angles or more power. Yeah, sure. Anybody can look good against some guy from Argentina that's, you know, 13 and 32. And 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 every boxer needs that that those those guys to get to that next step. Okay, Ryan, you're at that next step now. Now it's time to see what you got. You know what I mean? Are you and of I think the opinion that he's are you of the opinion that Ryan Garcia is overrated or or just that he's No, 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 no. Dude, he beat Devin Haney in the amateurs. His pedigree is real. Yeah. But, but as we know, the pro level is different than the amateur levels. There's no headgear. There's no, your, 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 your temples are exposed. Your chin's not locked into this fucking strap. I think Luke Campbell humbled him. I think he realized, mm -hmm. holy shit, I'm not, I'm not immortal. I can get fucking beat. I bleed the same blood. Like, holy shit. Like, just cause you got the cameras on you and the big crowd doesn't mean that you can't get beat. I mean, sure. They're building you up to be a champion, but. Doesn't mean you can't get knocked the fuck out. Luke Campbell fainted down and came right up with that beautiful overhand. And and Ryan almost took a nap. He when he hit the ground, he got up and went, whoa, whoa, whoa. It brought him to reality. And I feel like he still hasn't came to terms on whether he's ready to take that next step because of that fight. Now, yeah. now that fight might be the best turning point in his career because that can make a huge decisive decision on whether he's gonna take that step down and fight a couple more bums or he's gonna take that step up and and and, and rise and try to fight the champion eliminators and to be fair in retrospect i'm pretty sure before the campbell fight he was actually supposed to fight jorge linares and i i don't think yeah he, i don't think he was linares. linares buckled devin haney 
I, he had like Devin Haney on 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 spaghetti legs for a quick second there. And yep. Devin's got great defense. Ryan's not known to be a great defensive fighter. He's all offense. We haven't seen we we haven't seen him really how to do much much uh defense of offensive fighting. He's normally right. on the offense every time. I think the biggest challenge is, is when these guys have someone that's pushing the pace and they have to play defense to, you, to, you know, to put their punches together. That's where they get scared. Cause they're like, Holy shit. I've never had this pressure on me. I've never had someone, you know, pushing the pace, controlling the distance. Um, normally Ryan, you know, puts people away within the first, you know, first to fifth round. He, he's never really had to go the distance. Luke was probably his, his longest fight. Right. I think he's going when, the distance before that one. I think that one only went to the seventh or eighth, but it was definitely one of the that was fights that was ten had. that was that was set for ten rounds. Yeah, it might have been set for twelve to be honest. Yeah, it was because it was a WBA belt, right? Yeah, yeah. So that was a twelve round fight. Um, another thing is is. Is is he ready to go twelve rounds? Is he is he ready to go the distance? Who knows? Is he gonna slow up? He doesn't know what he's telling him. He we don't know what's going through his head right now. We don't know what he's trying to figure out either. And we have I've a gone, limited exposure to him against a certain I, level of opposition. You know, I, I did eight rounds with Bang Williams. Now I did get I did get dropped with a body shot in the fourth round. I didn't get dropped. I took a knee because I knew I had to make a smart investment to go the distance. Um, did it hurt me? Well, yeah, I was in his in his backyard. I mean, I went I went down to Delray Beach and fought him. The kid's from from Miami. You know what I mean? He's from he's from Miami, so he fights at a Fifth Street gym, and he's got Kevin Cunningham. It's already big A side look. Now, after that, he blew his low trying to knock me out, and I said, "All right, listen, there's there's two ways this goes now. He knocks me the fuck out because I'm still hurting to the body. I got to catch my win because he caught me on the bread basket, but." I'm going to sit here for the full eight seconds. So as soon as Samuel Borgo, you know, Samuel Burgos, he's a big name referee in um, Miami. As soon as he got the eight count, I stood up, I shook my hands on my, on my, um, on my chest, just let him know that I'm, I'm still coherent. I'm still here. And then he said, all right, fight. Bang, tried to jump on me and try to take me out. Now, this is where I knew I was going to have to play all defense and just try to cover my body up and protect my, my temples. The bell rings. The next round I notice his mouth, he's starting to breathe through his mouth. His hands are coming down to his chin. He's no longer here anymore. The countering isn't there. So I'm like, I'm just going to stay outside and pop my jab. I started landing the jab real flush and stepping outside and dancing and got on my bicycle. But as I'm on my bicycle, I'm doing that, you know, I'm doing more of that Muhammad Ali shuffle jab, shuffle jab, shuffle jab. And he's chasing, chasing me, chasing me. Can't land nothing on me. Now, I took it to a split decision. A lot of people thought I should have won. But when you're in someone's backyard, they got that A side draw. It's 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 like almost like you, you're bringing a knife to a gunfight. You know what I mean? Um, so I lost a split decision. But the thing is, is someone like Bang Williams, who they're creating out to be a kid with a lot of national pedigree. He's been to nationals multiple times. He's won junior Olympics, silver gloves, all that. I was supposed to get annihilated. I'm this kid that that from New England. I just broke out of the novice. I probably had 13 amateur fights. Um, I was supposed to get slept and and I, I was there to win, man. I wasn't there to fucking play around. Um, and that's the thing is you can't sleep on anyone. And I feel like Ryan sleeps on a lot of these guys. And now he's at the point where he can't sleep on anybody anymore. And like I said, someone like Bang Williams, who has the pedigree short, knows how to control the distance, knows how to put pressure on, knows how to fight and knows how to put punches together. But when it goes into those deep water rounds, can he can he swim or is he going to sink? That's where you're going to decide. Is Ryan going to be able to swim and shred water in 12 rounds? No one knows because he hasn't been there yet. Someone like Devin Haney that already has that experience, Jaravante Davis that already has that experience. Look what he just did with Isaac, Isaac Cruz. Yep. These guys know mentally that they can go 12 rounds. They've already been there with some big names, with some, with some top, top prospect fighters. So I think Ryan's trying to decide whether he needs to take that step down now and fight more of these B-side level fighters, or if he needs to take that jump up and he's going to go 50-50 draws against people like Gervonta or Devin Haney. But 
the confidence is already there for the for 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 Devin Haney and Jervante because they've already gone the distance. They already know what they can do. So it it, it it's weird to say that. Like I I don't think Ryan's a fake boxer. People are like, well, yeah, that's what you get for being a YouTube boxer. It's like, no, dude, this kid's been doing this for a long time. His family's had him in this since he was a kid. Him and his brother, uh, who I almost fought at one point, and he kind of ducked me, but we'll get into that after. Um, I think Sean's nothing like his brother. I'll tell you that much. Um, but people, people are always going to criticize. That's that's what they do. You know what I mean? That's what the fans are supposed to do. They're supposed to criticize, talk their but shit. Do, You're going to have the- he legitimately has like a confidence issue. Yeah, it's clear. It's clear now. Like, dude, you 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 wanted. Isaac Cruz after Juravante. It's like he goes after people's sloppy seconds. Okay, uh, Juravante beat Isaac Cruz. I'm going to have to fight Juravante. So let me see if I can test myself and go 12 rounds with Isaac Cruz. You know what I mean? I get what he's doing. And then he'll do things like all the um, opponents that they're going to choose for him. Oh, Devin Devin Haney. Well, Devin Devin Haney beat Jojo Diaz. Let me see if I can do 12 rounds with Jojo Diaz. You know what I mean? It's, It's funny. It's funny. But, like, some people aren't looking at that. They're like, he's ducking people. It's like, no, he's trying to dip his feet in the water. It's just it's just he, he he's not confident in himself, so he doesn't even know if he can compete with Jojo Diaz and Isaac Cruz. That's why he's backing out. I mean, he – there's a guy around here that's a big name. You, you're a boxing fanatic, so you probably heard of him, Javier Fortuna. Yep. He was going to fight Javier Fortuna. Now, I've heard, you know, Javier Fortuna drop a lot of people around my area – and he's great sparring and great work. That's not a dude you sleep on. I think Ryan realized he was in a real gunfight with a real fighter. And though he was the A side and Javier was the, the opposition, ha- Javi, the way he jumped on the contract and was so willing and fast to sign, I think it scared Ryan because people are probably kind of like, you know, give me, a, give me a couple of days to sign this contract and let me read it over with my team. And when Javi, Javi got right to the point, was like, let's do it. You know what I mean? I think Ryan was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Who the fuck is this guy? Probably watched some footage. was like, damn, this kid's real, like real deal. And right. his team was probably like, yeah, let's take a step back. So he played the mental game. It's like, but how many times are you going to play this mental game and, 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 and create this facade that you're, you're this big legendary name? You're the next Oscar De La Hoya. You're the golden boy of, of, uh, of the Mexican um, nationality. It's like, dude, that's why Canelo and their team cut him because he's, he's not realistic. He's not, he's, not, he's not intelligent when it comes up to here. He, he puts all his cards on the table. Someone like Joe Guzon, uh, an old veteran coach i think he can shape ryan and give him the right tools but ryan's gonna show him you know a peace of mind that 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 shows him that he wants to fight these guys and wants to be ready to fight them and and prepare and and preparation is key and then recovery and all that not just all right yeah i'm gonna hit the bag and take a video of me hitting the cobra bag and go on two mile run and then think i'm gonna go 12 rounds with isaac cruz it's not realistic you got to put the time in and do a full camp Recover well, hydrate well, and then get, get pick your big boy pants up and get in the fucking ring. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think he's he, developmentally he's in a position now, like he's had step up fights now, and I think that there has to if there's going to be multiple you know star young fighters in a division, the O cannot be a, a precious commodity. Like we we have to be willing to match these guys. Honestly, and let honestly, them learn he's gonna- from losing. He's going to open the doors for guys like me that's eight and three. I know I've lost to Aaron Aponte, Chris Jacobs, and 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 uh, Bang Williams. The only person ever put me down was Bang Williams with the breadbasket shot. Those are three real fighters here. I mean, Chris Jacobs was the New Hampshire state champ. Aponte was an Argentine Olympic trialist. And Bang Williams, like I said, over a hundred and something fights, amateur fights, and all junior Olympic national championships – whether he was quarterfinalist, silver silver medalist, or, or gold medalist. I mean, at one point, I'm pretty sure he was even a, an Olympic alternative. Um, you're going to have to fight real people at some point. And if you don't win, you don't win. doesn't mean you can't pick up the puzzle pieces and get right back on track, get a couple good wins, uh, you know, stepping stones, and then get right back to the, to the winning, the, the drawing board. Um, but, but, 
he's going to open doors for guys like guys that are guys that have the one, one loss in the record, second loss in the record. I think we need, it's time for boxing to be, to, to be more of a known fans sport. See that that it, that's it's, shallow. Fans see that there's, there's no depth to that. Oh, if there's no one under that record, you know what I'm saying? Like the fans. know. Yeah. That. Well, yeah. It, it, well, it's coming, coming to a point. It's like, well, who the fuck have you fought? You got guys that are 15 and 30 on your record. Right. And it's like, okay, okay, you're supposed to have a couple of those guys. But when you got 25 of them, it's like well, you got no – Somebody you, the next Oscar De La Hoya. You know, Oscar De La Hoya – Oscar has, fought T- Tito, T- Tito uh, Trinidad, fucking uh, Sweet Pea. He fought everybody. Yeah. I mean, you, he lost I mean, fights to Shane. Like, I don't think anybody thinks less of Oscar De La Hoya because he lost two fights to Shane Mosley because those are classic fights against another great fighter. You know what I mean? Shane Mosley and, and the, legacy. And, and 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 no doubt put put pressure on on pretty boy Floyd Mayweather. At right. the time, pretty boy, pretty boy Floyd was uh, was a big puncher before he started breaking his hands. He was knocking a lot of people out. And Oscar at one point flurried on him and put a lot right. of pressure. Not a lot of people had landed clean like that on, on, on Floyd. And so that was a big, 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 big change in Oscar's career, too, because that was not supposed to be the you know the expected. Everybody thought, you know, Floyd was going to do what he did and move around the ring and work that jab and work that style that he that he is so perfect with the Philly shell style. Um, And for Oscar to, you know, beat up on Floyd Mayweather for a good portion of the fight. And I mean, he's hung hung in with everybody. I mean, I, I I've never seen him get beat, 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 beat. You know what I mean? Like beat clean. Except Pacquiao. Um, Except Pacquiao. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Pacquiao beat the piss out of him. Yeah. He dropped him with a body shot, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, he dropped him with everything, bro. Um, real quick, I want to go back to the triad thing, bro. So, how did you segue your your own career into this this new this new medium? You know what I'm saying? Obviously, coming from like a classical boxing. All right tradition and and from the area so, that you come from so my cousin jeff fraser was on season one and two of the contender no um, which that's what yeah yeah he 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 is no longer with us god rest his soul um wait for real but i didn't know that yeah yeah that's oh. my cousin i'm a fourth generation boxer you have you ever heard of jeff Jeff fought yeah, bro. At Austin. Dude, the contender was a huge deal for me. I've, I've worked yeah. out with Alfonso Gomez before. Yeah, they were tight. Him and Alfonso were real tight. He's very good friends with Jimmy Lang. Um, I met Sergio Mora when I fought a Ponte because he commentates uh, the day zone fights. And he's like, oh, man, God rest Jeff's soul. He was a real good dude. Sergio's a, a, a kind-hearted guy. Um, Peter Manfredo, very close with Jeff. They, they fought in the amateurs together. My coach, uh, my old coach, Brendan Simo, actually beat him in the uh, junior Olympics, I think, or silver gloves, something along the lines of that. Um, but yeah, Jeff got called back in to fight at Caesars Palace. He got voted back to fight uh, Anthony Brent Cooper and beat him in dominant fashion. But long story short, my cousin Derek and him were, you know, a big name in amateur boxing back in the day, both winning national pal tournaments and, and a, a lot of different tournaments around the area. Um, Jeff, my uncle Norman, um, was going to be, uh, they wanted to bring him in as an Olympic coach, but he was going pro with my cousin Jeffrey at the time. So he was like, nah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to move forward and, and take my son to his next step in his career. So he, 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 um, passed on the whole trying to be an Olympic coach bullshit. Um, but my, it all started back from my grandfather. Long story short, I'm the fourth generation of boxing in my family. So for my family, this means a lot right now for the, for the amount of um, love I'm getting and I'm, I'm, all the calls that I'm getting for triad or whether it's boxing. And, you know, I've been in talks with Triller for a little bit about actually having a boxing match with them um, before the triad. So we're looking at May and then we're looking at June for Triller triad. Um, so we get some big things coming up, really big things coming up now being the first to win inside the, the Triller triad. That's huge. I mean, it's sellable. It's marketable. Everybody knows that. Like, I, I'm the first boxer to ever step in there and win inside a whole new sport. You know what I mean? So, we're kind of we're kind of selling it as you know, I want to be the face of of the triad. I want to be the first uh, world triad champ. I want to. I want to. I want to do things like that. I want to accomplish it. You know, because boxing's already got 
got a lot of the, the, the guys they've brought up. They already know who they want to sign. They've been watching these kids since they were eight years old. So it's tough for a guy like me that's 26 with three losses on my record to get signed by any big promotion. I mean, it's possible. Yeah. But I'm going to have to fight people like Delante Tiger Johnson, which I just got a call for that. Um, and uh, a lot of people were like, you know, that's a dangerous fight. I mean, he's 145, but he's 5'11". You, you already had a tough time with Aponte, who was, you know, six foot flat. It's like, you know, maybe you shouldn't be fighting these taller guys, these bigger guys. So I'm staying in my lane. I'm going to be at 135. Might go down to 130. I'm going to try. Um, but I, I, there's no sense in going up and wait to fight someone like like Delante Tiger Johnson, who's uh, an Olympic bronze medalist. When it when it's such a big A side against such a small B side, it's not like it's a 50 50 draw. So I'm really I might as well bring a gun and, and shoot him to win that fight. You know what I mean? Like it's I have to knock him out. There's no doubt about it. Um, that's how boxing is though. That's, and I, and respectfully. So, um, when my manager spoke with, uh, Brad Goodman, the matchmaker, he's like, you know, it's a winnable fight, but it's going to be tough to win. I'm not going to lie to you guys. And we, we said, no, we're, we're not going to take that. We're not, we're not, we're not, we're going to pass on that. We're going to get a couple wins and we're going to see where we can go from there. Um, mainly what I want to do with my career is I'm hoping down the line, Triller has some contract deals. Um, cause I'd like to sign long-term with them. I like, I like their whole team. They pay well. Um, they're just good people, man. I like Ryan Cavanaugh. I like how he does everything. They just, um, partnered up with bare knuckle boxing too. So I'm not going to get into that shit, but I, I like, um, I like where they're heading and I like the way they market themselves. So do you see this, and- this triad is sort of like, a like an alternative way for you to kind of get your name out there in a bigger platform. That's not a standard promoter because it's, I know a lot it's of not people- like, it's not like I got to fight with the middleman and then have some middleman uh, club fighter promoter, you know, whore me out to these a big a side promotions, like, like top rank. And, and it's like, all right. Yeah. It's very clear that I'm getting paid like, low money right now to fight this guy that's probably getting paid 25,000. I I I want to I'm a prize fighter. I don't want to be I don't want to be a professional opponent. I want to be a professional A side. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, in order to market myself, I see myself in the Triller Triad um building my name there. With that said, will I go back to boxing and get a couple wins? Yeah, because I don't want to keep being announced as eight and three in boxing one and oh in triad like i want to be the next time i go back i want to be nine and three i want to be nine and three with maybe a good flash ko i want to sell it beautifully you know what i mean i want to uh this is what i'm training for i'm ready i'm ready for whoever but i'd like to see me get back on the drawing boards maybe get a nice a side win um and then see where we can go with triad i got a rematch against jacob thrall he was tough as nails the first time it's going to be seven rounds this time um it's going to be, you know, a good fight, but I believe I've already felt him out. I've already felt his power. He could barely make it out of five with me. I, the way I'm training, I'm, I could go nine rounds. I could do the championship fight if I really wanted to, but I get it. Kubrat Polev is a gold medalist in the Olympics. He's so fought, fought on Joshua. the same part as Pulev? Yeah, dude, I met Polev. I was, I met Shannon Briggs. I got some videos, um, but yeah, they're all real good guys. I met Shannon Briggs. I met Brian Vera, who was on the contender. Brian Vera, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tough, tough as nails, by the way. He yeah. lost lost a fight that was probably should have got fight of the night. Couldn't believe it didn't. Besides my fight, which that could be a bias, you know what I mean? Uh, a conflict of interest because it's me. I thought that that was probably the best fight of the night. Mike Perry and Mike Seals was a good fight too. And Mike Seals was a good fighter, man. Um, he retired from boxing after one loss. And it's like a lot of these guys got to get away from, well, now I'm going to be nobody because I got that loss. It's like, dude, you can still do this. Like it's, it's very possible. I feel like they let up on themselves. Um, Alexander Flores. Um, he got stopped by uh, Ortiz, but real good fighter, real good hands. I think it was just too soon for him to take a fight like that with Ortiz. I mean, Ortiz dropped the line. I mean, uh, dropped Deontay Wilder. I mean, he's, he's a real deal. You know what I mean? So I, I don't know. It's just, um, 
there's so many things that we could do with the triad and they can market it from so many different levels, whether they want to bring Muay Thai guys in, whether they want to bring more MMA guys in, more boxers in, kickboxers. You could you could mix a lot of different styles into this this this, this thing, man, because styles make fights, all right. And sure, you bring an MMA guy into a boxing ring, there's too too much distance to control the boxer. Yeah, but you bring them into a small, it's basically the, the triangle is like half a ring. If you were to cut a ring in half, that's what with the triangle, the triad would be. There's no chance for the boxer to really control the distance the whole fight without getting clipped at some point. You know what I mean? I mean, I learned that. Like at the at, when I first got in, I, I went from being like, like, because they all right, so this is what they did. We got there, we were they there was the weigh-ins, and then they had the team, like your coaches and stuff, go over and check the triad out. So I got a ton of pictures sent to me. They didn't let anyone go in the triad. So no one knows what the fuck to do. I'm the first ever to go in. So so I got like people like Kubrat Polev and I'm going like, make sure you tell us like how how tight, you know, the triangle is. I'm like, I got you. And I was like, I'll, I'll count how many steps, you know, like I counted like two or three steps and then you're on the rope. So it's like, oh man. Shit. Right. When I got in there, when I got in there, I circled around and I was like, yeah, there's, there's no space here, man. There's really no space. You're kind of like, you're made, it's like a shootout, bro. You're made to go oh, in yeah, there yeah. and, do, and dog fight. How do you train for that? How do you, how do you train for that in a standard boxing gym? Um, so I had, when I, when I had camp formed out for that, I only had three weeks. I was at, I was at, I was going out for Halloween. I was at, at dinner with my girlfriend and my friend Kyle and we had drinks and I'm sitting there and I'm buzzy and I get a call from my previous promoter um, of Boston boxing promotions. And he's like, dude, so uh, Eric Bodger called me, which he's the matchmaker for Triller. And he's like, he's like, uh, dude, Tr- Triller's got this new crazy fight idea. So it's going to be in like a triangle um it's supposed to be boxers versus mma and the rules are there's there's um spinning back fist superman punching all the shit the first thing i say is yeah let's do it and he's <laughs> like all right but it's in it's in three weeks so i'm like fuck i like i'm gonna have to get up tomorrow pretty hung over and, and get my fucking ass on the road yeah so i i i got right into camp the next day right from halloween and uh I put every day in, you know what I mean? And um, we brought Muay Thai guy in, uh, a Muay Thai guy in named uh, Brendan Marat, but she's also um, ranked number seven in the uh, lightweight division in New England. Um, and he does a lot of Muay Thai work. He is, uh, his, his sensei is Rick Hahn. Rick Hahn has one of the fastest knockouts in, um, in Bellator history. So I was like, you know, I'm going to have this guy that's more MMA style, traditional MMA style, knows how to clinch and work inside. And that's the thing to be worked on, working the clinch, turning out, things like that, um, and working the dynamics of getting cut off, like cutting the ring off um, from like a triangle standpoint, like cutting it in half with like the the slip rope. It was fucking real weird, man. It's just like if, if this sport takes off, and I make enough money. I'm going to invest in the first gym that's like circulated around strictly being triad. I think like I'll have a boxing ring in there, but I'll be like, all right, on this side over here, guys, this is for the triad fighters. You know so you're I mean? sparring like, with you're sparring with like a, a slip rope down the center of the ring. Are you sparring with like smaller gloves at all? Are you doing you know? Well, so so I actually re- just recently started um, sparring with those eight ounce turtle. They're turtle backs. The turtle back gloves are basically MMA sparring gloves. They're eight ounce. Um, dude, they they don't feel like eight ounce gloves, though. They, they feel like bricks. If you sparred like full on how I spar in the gym with a lot of my guys, we'd be all cut up. Like those things are fucking dangerous. Right. Um, so like when I started, like the last time I sparred with them, I went to my, my brother's MMA gym, Hudson Combat. And uh, like you got to touch. Like you, you, it's all light, light sparring. Because those things can mess you up. Um, and I don't know really how. Them. I don't really know how to spar spar in them yet. You know what I mean? Like I'm still trying to figure that out without like killing the person that I'm sparring with. Because if I get hit one good time, I'm gonna turn the volume up, and then it's gonna turn into a, a to a dog fight. Um, so you gotta be really light with how you punch with them. You're almost better off getting eight ounce boxing gloves and just sparring in those. 
Right. You know what I mean? Like, right. yeah, that's a, that's something that I might start doing, maybe 10 ounce, just so it's a little more heavier on the hands. Um, right. or, I, I mean, even if you're hitting the bag with the, with the fingerless gloves, at least getting used to, you know. Oh, I do that. All, I do that all the time anyways. Yeah. When I'm so when I'm training strictly boxing, I'll I'll wear my 16 ounce gloves when I'm training. Like when I get the call for triad, which now that it's now we're in session, now we're now we're talking about camp and all that with that. I'm going to have to start wearing them a lot more. You know what I mean? But um, still, just to get my hands laser fast and a little heavier, I'm going to be doing punch weights and 16 ounce gloves and all that still. Just because when you put the, when you make that transition to the eight ounce, it's like, whoa, holy shit. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, it, it's different. The dynamics of the sport, I'm still trying to figure out. Right. Now, I, I have a couple different ways to approach the next time I get in there that I already kind of, you know, foresaw just watching my fight over and over and over again. But that's something that I can't tell you right now because, you know, I got to, I got to use that as, as leverage for my next fight. So do you have a date for the next fight? So it's aimed for June. That's what they're aiming for. And they're saying either Hollywood beach Seminole, um, the hard rock, or they're going to try and do LA Staples center. Now the crypto center. Right. formerly the formerly the the staple center um we'll see we'll see what's going on man i we're still negotiating the logistics side of it the payday all that um i want to be a face of this though man i want to be like a big name involved in, in in triller triad i'm a big fan of it i i, I love mma i did one mma fight and got choked the fuck out I actually um, first this kid who's local in my town, Tom uh, Tom the Phenom Paggy the Ruo, very good fighter, definitely I mean, he's state champion wrestler, all that. He didn't want to box me, I'll tell you that much. I ate a kick right on the thigh right when the the fight began. My my leg instantly went purple. Um, I got I I had him in like a like for a split second. I had him in a guillotine. I got out of a Kimura. I don't know how I did. Um, and then I got choked out. I got rear naked choked at the end of the second round. But long story short is I took that on five days notice. If I had more time, I'm, I'm, I'm such a, a fight guru when it comes to it. I can adapt. You know what I mean? I can adapt, but you got to give me time. Like three weeks was enough to at least make some, some um, transitions and adjustments over to, to, to kind of that, that more Muay Thai dirty boxing style, getting the clinch and stuff and working off it in the body and stuff. Um, but for MMA, man, you gotta you gotta do a full full camp. That's a whole nother dog fight. Yeah. Um, well, and I'm know, happy. I like your, I get your it. boxing skills would apply more to the the triad. You know. Well, uh, I I I assume. Well, yeah, in MMA traditional boxing, your legs out, so you get kicked in the leg a ton if you try to box an MMA fighter, um, especially in a cage. Um, but here, you can kind of somewhat control the distance. Dude, not really though. Like the jab is not useful in the triad. I tried. I tried doing. I was like, oh man, I'll be able to pepper the kid with my jab all night. Nah, I had to slow him down. And then when he started kind of going flat footed and trying to walk me down, that's when I started pepping the jab and pop, 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 doubling it and popping it and using it to set up more punches, like whether it was a body shot or a quick flurry in the inside, little shoe shine. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't just go out there the first round with all that fire with him whooping big shots at me trying to jab, out jab him. I got caught like six times trying to do that. I was like, what the fuck? I remember at one point I was there and I had my hands on my head and I was like, do I even fucking want to be here right now? Like, what the fuck is this shit? And then I was like, nah, bro, this is awesome. I was like, I, I, I'm here all night, baby. And I fucking, I like snapped it back together. I was like, all right. I got to see how he's throwing these punches right now because I just got my, – my whole eye over here was swollen. I'm like, yeah, that was a pretty hard hit. Um, I got to figure out where he's hit, how he's hitting me, how he's getting through right now. So once I started, you know, giving him more of like this, like – I don't, I don't want to I don't want to say it like this, but like a more of a taekwondo look, like keeping my hand out here and like being able to catch the punches. Um, that's where I started controlling the distance. Like I was like, right. yeah, you got to par- you got to parry the shots. Like it's, it's weird. It's not like boxing where you can kind of roll with them. You know what I mean? You can't roll with them. There's not enough padding on that glove to, to really play defensive boxing. It's dude, it's a whole new sport. Like my coach, 
um, Gene Baraldi is like, yeah, I want to be in your corner for it. He goes, but you're going to be having to teach me things because no one knows, you know, this is, you know, more about it than any of us. Like where's, we're still trying to figure it out. And I'm like, yeah, I, I kind of have like a game plan um, where I've watched it so many times. And I'm like, yeah, this is where you got to step to play this, this chess game in this fucking ring. Um, and that's my, my plan is to, to make this a beautiful, beautiful boxing match. Like make this, make this look embarrassing for thrall this time. Like really, really shut him out, make him, make him look like a fucking novice boxer. You know what I mean? Cause last time I, I, I got into the gunfight with him and, and honestly, he got the better of me the first two rounds. Once I controlled that distance three to five, I was outboxing the shit out of him. I, I slipped people like you got knocked down though, on the end of the fifth round. It's like, no, I, I slipped. I slipped because I was square and flat footed trying to walk him down and trying to knock him out. Cause I wanted the knockout bonus. It was like 10 K. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going for that knockout bonus regardless. I was like, fuck it. I'm biting down my mouth guard and going for it. And because of that, he ducked his head. He was in like, I caught him with an overhand right and stumbled him. And I watched his face and I'm like, ooh, almost knocked him out with that one. I'm like, I'm going to jump on him. So I jumped on him and tried shoe shining. And he started winging overhands and he clipped me and clipped me again. And I'm like, fuck that. And I bit down and just started trying to knock him out. And I ended up almost getting knocked. Not, I don't want to say I almost got knocked out, but I got clipped and I got rocked and then went down. But it was more of me being off balance. I got right up and put my hands up. Like, I wasn't like, whoa, like I've been on wobble, wobble, wobble street, bro. That was not even close to like, it was, it was just a good punch that I had ran in on because I was flat footed. It looked way more over dramatic right. than it, than it had to be, but that's the dynamics of the fight. If that bell didn't ring, that would have been a standing eight count. That would have hurt me, man. That probably would have, uh, would have lost me the fight. So this time around, I'm just going to make this a beautiful fight. I'm not looking for the knockout. The payday will come. I'm going to just beat this kid and get, get that next fucking step up to the next, next, next uh, opponent. So That's pretty much where I'm at. Long, in the long term, do you kind of see this as, you know, this is a, an opportunity for you to build with something new, or do you think that it's, it's something where you could, you could make some noise in this and then it opens up opportunities in the boxing world or, or is it both? I mean, it, it kind of, it kind of goes back and forth to what you just said. Um, I love boxing. Boxing will always have a piece of a piece of me. And, 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 and like, I'm a prize fighter. I don't look at myself as a boxer anymore because I just was the first to win inside this. I, I, I created so much more noise than I have in three years in boxing. Now, sure, I was a local standout. I'm known in New England. I'm known to be tough. I'm known to have a Mickey Ward style. I can box. I can brawl. People love that. But there's already so many names in boxing. They already have who they want to be to be champion. They already know who they want. Whether it's right now Gervonta is a champion, they already know who can beat Gervonta. They're like, well, this kid's very good and he's worth the investment because, you know, he, he does this differently and he might, that style might be able to beat Gervonta. You know what I mean? They don't have that for Triller Triad. Right now, I am the only one to win inside the featherweight division. So, they don't have who they, they, they don't know who they have planned out to be their champion. They don't know. It's still up in the air. Now, after being the first one to win against a kid that's pretty known in, oh, in Missouri for being a very known brolic MMA fighter, very tough. Um, he was a champion at one point too in, in amateur MMA. I beat him. I beat him in his own dynamics of how he wanted to fight inside the triad, cutting the distance off, putting pressure. So right now I am the number one ranked inside Triller Triad. I mean, that's just how it is. There's no other person to, to beat me. I'm undefeated. So it's sellable. That's where I'm at. This is all marketing. I'm a prize fighter, not, not, uh, not, not a B side opponent, not, not uh, some stepping stone, not, not some tomato can. I'm here. I'm not, I'm not fucking playing around. I want to be the best, but, Right now in boxing, it's impossible for me to be the best, not because of the three losses, because they already know who they want to be their best. For Triller Triad, I can be the greatest of all time. Right, and it's all, it's all up in the air. It's all being established <laughs> right now in the moment. Exactly. That's, so, so where I'm at right now is I will always go back to boxing. If, there's, if the money talks, I'm in. But 
I want to make sure it benefits me because I'm not some opponent. If it's a 50, 50 fight, I'm all in. If it's me being an A side, I'm all in. You're calling me to, for $4,000 to go fight as a B side against some kid that that's getting paid 15,000 and he's an Olympian. Not today, not going to happen. Now, Sure. Down the line, I get a couple wins. They, they ask me, oh, you want to fight Keyshawn Davis for this much money, whether he's making a hundred thousand, I'm making 50,000. I'll probably can't yeah, work. I already have the experience. I'll fight him. Yeah. That's the, that's worth the money, but I'm not going to be some opponent for, for Joe Schmo money. I, that's not how I look at it. I'm a prize fighter. I know my self worth. A lot of kids will jump right on that. Be like, yeah, word. Yeah. Okay. I'll take the 4,000. It's like, not me. I've done that. I did that because I had a promoter that was in it for the money and I, and, and, and it ruined my career, not ruined it, but it, it made me take a step back. And now I have to pick up the pieces again. After I beat Brandon Higgins, we had the momentum. I beat a kid that was a quarterfinalist nationals. Everybody thought he was going to wipe me. He was no, the, one of the biggest names in new England boxing when he was an amateur, everyone knew who Brandon Higgins was. All right. If you went to the Lowell Golden Gloves, you knew who he was. I made a boxing clinic, a mockery out of the kid. He can say whatever he wants. It was a majority decision. They still tried to rob it and make it a draw. One ref, one, 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 uh, one judge had it in, in favor of a draw. I don't fucking even understand how, but it's political. It's politics. It's just how the game goes. I should have took that momentum and we should have beat another step up, not jumped right up to Bang Williams and been like, yep, let's get right in with him. But I got threatened to get blackballed. I was threatened that they'd bench me for the rest of the year. So I said, fuck it. I'll fight Bang. I was like, I'll fight him. I don't give a so shit. It was essentially this fight or you're not going to be active for the, rest of the year. For, for the rest of the year, which technically I didn't know this, but that's um, against all rulings of the Muhammad Ali Act. I could have fucking took him to court for that and made the made that a whole big spew. Long story short, I just wanted my contract. I wanted to see through it. Something, you know, some things were said and and uh, I I hurt some feelings, but I got my contract. I read through it. Didn't like anything on the contract. Nothing in the context was adding up. Um, I was finding out that I lost like 33.3% every of all those fights to my, my promoter. Um, that's a lot of money when, when you're getting in the ring and you're getting paid such low money and he's taking, you know, a quarter of it, a, a more than a quarter. Um, it, 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 it stung, you know what I mean? More than anything, it was like, damn, like I've been putting three years of fighting in to get robbed out of money. Like hard earned, hard earned working money that I put my brain on the line to get hit. You know what I mean? Um, and I'm getting threatened along the way of that that I'll I won't fight the rest of the year. Like it, it's just it's just these guys the 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 audacity they think they can do to get away with that kind of bullshit. It's not going to happen. And I'll tell you what, me signing with Triller, I'm so confident that I can make such a big name, and I feel comfortable with them working as my promotion because the way that they run it is way more promotion uh, pro professional than a lot of guys like Dana white paying his fighters 30%. Well, he takes 70. That's fucking insanity. And it's cool. All right. Sure. Sure. Buddy, you're making your money. Cool. Yeah. You only paying guys like McGregor Khabib because they make money for you. And you know that that's, that's, that's worth it. But it's like, bro, you're taking 70% of what they're getting hit here, putting their life on the line, all in that cage. That's not cool. That's not cool at all. I won't stand. Do I like Dana White? Huge fan. But when it comes to business, when it comes to marketing, that's fucking ass. That's not right at all. So, I mean, I speak my mind, man. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a realist. I'm going to tell you how it is. I like Triller because they pay their fighters equally and rightfully. Any promotion that does that, like I've heard, I've heard Showtime's kind of iffy. Like I heard like they pay their fighters and sometimes they don't, but with like, I heard El Heyman's not a scumbag. I heard he's like pretty, pretty equal guy. Like he, you just got to talk to him. He's very standout. And I, I've heard the same thing with Bob Aaron. Like sure. With the, with the thing that just happened with um, Bud Crawford. I mean, it's just, a, it's a slippery slope. Do I think it had racism involved? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know Bob Arum. 
You know what I mean? But a lot of people said, you know, he's done this to a lot of other black fighters. So it's like, all right, you know, I guess you could create a story for that, but you could do that with any promotion. You know what I mean? Like, I, like essentially you could say Oscar De La Hoya is racist towards black people because uh, he benched Rashidi Ellis for so long. And it's like, okay, because he didn't want to fight Virgil Ortiz. It's like, well, Virgil's Mexican. So it's kind of like, whoa, like, whoa, you could create a story off that. You know what I mean? It's just, um, I don't like the fact that these promoters think they can bench fighters. They, they can sit you out for, you know, this long. Oh, because the, all right, you don't want to fight for this money. You don't want to fight that opponent. It's like, yo, we, we should be able to decide who we want to fight and how much we want to get paid without any reper repercussions. Like right. that's, that ain't right. You can't dangle something over my head and be like, yo, well, then you ain't going to fight. It's like, oh, so I, I get up, I get my gloves on and I've been in the gym putting my time in for this fight. And I, I disagree with you and you dangle this on my head. I don't know, man. That's just some that's some sleazeball shit. And I so, think honestly, with some, with the with the Bob Arum Crawford situation, the the biggest issue for me and for a lot of people was that he would be out openly out in interviews saying that Terrence Crawford is not marketable. So what? Regardless, I mean, he's of, one of the he's one of the most marketable fighters right now. He's disparaging, you know, a fighter that he should be out like. And I was talking about this with Otis Griffin. But if then, but then, was my he, fighter. I would be out in public with my big fucking mouth saying, "I have the best fighter on planet Earth." Well, no shit. Like you know what I'm saying, dude? I give kudos to Showtime Porter for getting in the ring with him. That dude's a bad motherfucker. Um, let alone Porter has never dodged anyone. You can say gatekeeper. No, bro. He's a master class oh, no, fighter. He's, he's not an opponent. He's not a gatekeeper. He's not an opponent. Like, don't I don't like when people label that, like, yeah, well, he's a gatekeeper now. It's like, no, he just doesn't give a fuck. He'll get in there with anyone, bro. He's ballsy. He's tough. <laughs> like, if more people were like that in the sport, we wouldn't have people like Ryan Garcia sitting back home. Well, I don't want to fight him. It's like, well, buddy, get in the fucking ring and do your job. But my point being, imagine being Bob Arum and having I know, Terrence Crawford have, sign to you and you're responsible for him. And in public, and, you feel comfortable saying, I can't sell this kid. What do you want me to do? It's like, bro, you, that's dude, not. He would, have, he, he would fight anyone. He'd fight Earl Spence. He's, isn't he fighting? No, Earl's going to fight you guys, right? Dude. That's just fighting I, I, think, next. I think that's a bad matchup. I think I think I think Bud Crawford beats Uguez if they ever were to fight. I really do. I think he, he that Selpaw style when he tr tr traditionally jumps back to unortho I mean that orthodox, he's very unorthodox. He's a versatile fighter. He can beat you from any angle. That dude is the real deal. 100%. Like people don't like to admit it. But then you get you get like Fury and you get Lomachenko and and they're profitable and they're sellable. But what makes Terrence so different like he can sell a pay-per-view he could easily right well and i mean it, not for nothing that's sort of where the the racial element so play into it uh, that i get what you mean There's 90 the years flag. old he's 90 years old bro you know what i mean like the, it's a the different thing generation. is the, the thing is a lot of these guys don't look for things like perpetuity so you sign this three to five year deal and you're like okay i'm only on this for three to five years it's like all right it's a long portion of my career but I'm sure we can wean out some of the things, but then there's this little word that they squeeze in called perpetuity. And it means that they own you for life, whether it's your memorabilia, all your fucking trophies and uh, everything goes to the hall of fame under their fucking pay. They're making the money off that. Like I was on my, on my last contract. If there was ever a Harry Jigliotti hologram, my promoter was going to make money off that. And it's like, Dude, you went so beyond that the future was going to have holograms of fighters that you wanted to own the rights to that. Like, dude, they own life insurance on people. So if they die, all the money goes to them, not the family that deserves it. Like, there's some really scumbag shit that promoters that try real? to do. It's very real. Wow. It's very real. Life insurance. Boxing, have you seen any? Have you seen anything with life insurance involved or perpetuity? Don't sign the contract. Turn around and say, "Fuck that. That ain't for me." And then a lot of promoters do that shit because you think like, "Okay, after three years, I'm done." No, bro. He owns you for perpetuity. If he decides he wants to sit you out for the rest of your career, you better get a damn good lawyer 
because that perpetuity right there means he owns you. He owns you. Owns everything besides your family and your girlfriend. Is he that, owns is you. Is that to some extent what Mikey Garcia went through with Top Rank? I mean, essentially being yeah, benched, yeah. But you know? but listen, this is the, the discussion. Is um, you can't make someone a work slave. It's it's illegal. That's where the Muhammad Ali like kick act kicks in. You you pull that card, you can fuck a lot of these guys. I'm yeah. trying to teach these guys that aren't that aren't um that 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 aren't educated that don't know the 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 laws of boxing. You, a lot of these guys could be suing Bob Aram and and I don't want to throw other names out, God forbid. But but yeah, because of this shit, right? Because of shit like this. Now, if they just sit down at a logistics meeting and 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 said, "Listen, this is how I want the contract to be," I guarantee you, fucking people like Bob Aram were like, "We'll take a hike." You know what I mean? So it's kind of like a, a lose-lose situation. All right, you sign the contract, you make some good paydays. If he decides he doesn't like you, you're not marketable. Well, you're you're sitting out for the rest of the year. It's it's fucked up. It's really fucked up. And if you don't have a lawyer and you don't invest uh, in in good management, you get stuck with this promoter that doesn't give a rat's ass about you in the first place. He built you up all this time just to get you knocked down by a guy like Earl Spence. You know what I mean? That's it. But they're relying, they're relying I think, on fighters not understanding the business part of it as well. They're relying on that. Well, yeah, dude. A lot of these, you got to remember, Mike Tyson got taken advantage by Don King. He was a kid from Brownsville that wasn't educated, that came from the streets. He he had Custom Idol as a father figure. Cust dies. Now, all of a sudden, he's going around, jumping around from coach to coach. Everyone's using him once a piece of Mike Tyson. He's the youngest champion. He's sellable. He's fucking an absolute animal people are like oh i want a little piece of him i want a little piece of him too okay yeah okay let's create a rape scandal on mike too oh we can create a crazy story because he's fucking crazy dude he's nuts he'll get in the ring and bite someone's ear off this is so marketable it's so fucked up but that's what they do they take advantage of people that aren't educated and they make a mockery out of it they create a story that's it that's why like the number one thing is is when like when someone when a promoter does something and someone asked me to like, Harry, you're pretty good with this stuff. Like, like, what do I do? And I'm going to read through the Muhammad Ali act right here. I'll send you everything and I'll send them through MMA. Cause I've had a couple from MMA hit me up and I'll send them all the, all the rights through the Muhammad Ali back. Uh, strictly just boxing. People are like, Oh shit, bro. Like I've highlighted like three or four things that my promoter is doing illegally right now. And I'm like, well, yeah, they're not going to be like, Hey, by the way, go read the Muhammad Ali act. Because that, that wouldn't benefit them. Right, right. Go go make sure you understand your rights. Go, go right. make sure you understand everything before you sign this. Yeah. No, yeah. they're not going to do that. But these are loopholes oh. that fighters – these are things that fighters do need to know. Because you have a right to protect yourself. Me, like I said, I feel comfortable with Triller. My, my manager I just signed with, Brian Evans, is cool with all of them. And he knows he's in the music industry. He's a producer. He works with uh, Narada Michael Walden, who uh, produced Whitney Houston, Elton John, some of Elton John's music, everybody in the game. Dude, there's not one person they haven't fucking met inside the music industry that they were like, yeah, that guy's a scumbag. Like, dude, it's the same thing. It's entertainment. You know what I mean? So you're going to come across people that are like money hungry scoundrels that are like, oh, yeah, look, uh, I know how to pick this guy's brain and use him for this and create a story and a scenario. And dude, that's what they do. It's marketing. So they market you out to be the bad guy. Like like whoever signs Slim Shady, I'm sure at one point they're like, oh, dude, he's all fucked up on drugs. This is awesome. We can sell this. You know what I mean? Oh, he's fucking passing out on the wake up show on the, on the morning show. Oh, this is awesome. You know what I mean? Like it's not awesome, but this is how they do it. This is how they market the industry. It's marketable and it's whatever sells and puts money in their pocket. Sure. Let the show go on. I mean, it doesn't hurt them. So where I, I'm, I'm genuinely curious, where, where did your, um, like desire to, to understand the business side of it, or at least, um, you know, that awareness to be like, I really need to have an understanding of what's going on here so that I'm not exploited so, in the same way that so, so many other fighters have been. So I took criminal law and American government uh, in college and and I wanted to be a criminal justice uh, major, but I got a couple slip ups in my life, whether with drinking, <laughs> the worst thing, uh, drinking and being a fucking 
you know, disorderly conduct and being a dumbass, just young, young youth stuff that I, I got arrested a couple of times. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to focus on boxing and I'm going to get away from this street life and do what I got to do to, to be successful. Um, so once I started cutting certain people out, you know, things started getting better. I got into boxing. I was kind of forced into signing a contract deal with uh, Boston Boxing Promotions because my coach was like, I'm cool with them, blah, blah, blah. But I always kind of sent some funny shit. You know what I mean? Like, I always had that, like, well, if it doesn't feel right, it isn't right. Like, if it smells like shit, it's fucking shit. And, like, I go from Triller Triad. This is when I realized it. Well, I always realized it, but this is when I really realized it. I came back from the Triller Triad. And I was like, all right, so I just went from this big stage. And now I lose to Bang Williams before that in September. And he wants me to get in and fight the undefeated and he also New England champion, Nick Molina. And I'm like, yo, that's risky. And like, I'm not getting paid to fight him. I'm doing a six, a eight round fight against Nick Molina. I think I could outbox him. He thinks he can outbox me. So it's a 50 50 fight realistically, but we're not getting paid to do it. We're getting, I have to whore tickets out again. I have to go sell tickets and be a whore. It's like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this shit again. I'm not fucking, this drives me crazy. That's like bringing me into the mall and then bringing me into a fucking a thrift store. <laughs> it's like, I have seen all these nice things and these beautiful lights and all, all these nice stores. And then you're bringing me into a thrift store. It's like, I'm not going back to a, a, a club fight in a function hall after I just went in front of the big lights with Harry Jigliotti on a fucking big scoreboard. You know what I mean? I just, right. th- I was like, so I'm going to, I was like, I'm going to find a way off this contract. I linked in. I had been talking to Brian Evans for about a year and a half now, two years. Um, and I was like, you know, you have a lot to do with law and, and um, you know, dealing with guys like this. And I was like, I just want to find a way out of this. So he's like, let me talk to my lawyer. So he connected me with Mr. Hoffman who's like Adele's lawyer and all these other big names out in, in Las Vegas. And um, he read through the fucking contract and like right off the bat, like there was a misspelling in my name. There was like a highlight, like a couple, he highlighted a couple different things. He's like, yeah, this fucking contract's fake. He's like, this is a, this is a fluke of a contract. He's like, he's like, who are the names down here? I'm like, so the, one of the bystanders, the witnesses um, was from my gym you can't have a conflict of interest on a contract. If I know that person or he knows that person, it means that like you need a lawyer to come in and and sign that. You know what I mean? Like you need someone like big, like a bigger name, not, not someone that's from my gym that knows me. You know what I mean? Like that's a conflict of interest. So um, basically what happened there was um, the whole thing, the whole thing in the, the context of the contract was just like this fake fucking thing. And I was like, all right, I'm terminating this contract today. I'm going to make an announcement. And I CC'd the lawyers in. Um, and within 48 minutes, I was off the contract. Boston Boxing gets back and they're like, oh, good luck, Harry. All right. And I'm like, all right, yeah, no problem. Now, he wouldn't take his name off my box rec, which really fucking pissed me off. And I'm like, dude, just take your name off my box rec. Like, you're not, I'm not fighting for Boston Box anymore. So there's no reason for you to be under my promoter. You know what I mean? Like, that's not that we're not doing this. We're not going to do it. And he wouldn't take it off for the longest time until finally my manager reached out and was like, listen, like, like, we're not trying to hurt anybody's name here. We're not trying to hurt anybody's feelings here. We're trying to move on and look for the best route for Harry right now. So if you care about Harry, basically, you'll take your name down off that fucking thing. Now. They came up with some bullshit spiels and they were like, you will have it off within the next day. It was gone. So it benefited to me, but that was because I had a good manager that knew the rights that I, and, and showed me the whole way, like, okay, you can get away with this. So I didn't necessarily self-educate myself as more. I was mentored. You know what I mean? I was mentored. I, I had someone there to highlight all this shit and go, okay, this right here, these little words, like I didn't know what perpetuity even fucking meant. I'm going to be real. I know big, I know, I I know what big words mean. Like I normally like, well, like, like, Hmm, like 
that just doesn't seem right. But I totally skimmed past that section in, in the contract. Um, it was like a two page contract, three page con contract. I heard if it's more than one page, run. That's what I heard. That's what I've been told. And if the big wigs are telling you that, well, then I've heard people have like a thousand page contracts. And it's like, whoa, right. if I had a thousand page contract in front of me, I'd be like, I'm not signing this. There's yeah. something in this in this fat booklet that like owns the whole probably owns my family. Like I'm not signing yeah, this. Yeah, shit. I shouldn't yeah, have yeah. to fucking read Harry Potter for us to make an agreement. For real. So it's like the business side of boxing, when they say it's fucking dirty, it's really, really dirty. Like it's a, it's it's as dirty as it sounds. Um, yeah. with that said, when you meet guys that are down to earth, like Eric Bodger and the whole team over at Triller, like Ryan Cavanaugh, them, they're good people. They've been through the shits too, man. They, they know how the game goes. And when they're telling you that promoters and man and promoters and matchmakers will come to them and whore fighters to them, that's not a good word when they're saying, Oh yeah, no, they pimp, they pimp their fighters. Like to me, that's like them basically saying, you know, they're using fighters to make money. And I don't like that. I don't like that at all. That's not right to the fighters. It's not fair to the fighters. So it's kind of like one of those things where, you know, we need to, we need it. We need to bring this to light. We need people to know this is what fighters like Bud Crawford are going through. This is what people, people are going through right now. They just want to fight, man. They want to get, they want right. to make money for their family. Sure. The entertainment side, I love getting in that ring, but I'm not there to have a fun time. I'm there to fucking get paid. I'm there to fucking try. I'm there to win. So when I'm getting used and I'm being threatened that if I don't take the fight, I'll get blackballed. That's where I'm, I'm totally fucking out. I'm done. Well, like, and I'm, naturally I'm done. because and naturally, because you know, your, your value, right? They're immediate. Well, this kid doesn't fucking, he doesn't fall in line. So he's, you know what I mean? So then a pro, dirty promoters, you'll be like, yo, he doesn't fall in line. He's, he's a problem because you actually know your value. I know my shit. Um, but like I said, did I do a lot of uh, self-educating? Yeah. I was mentored. I was shown. Right. Everything was brought to light for me. If you don't find the right manager that actually has love for you and actually wants to show you these things and teach you, then you're never going to know because they want to make their money too. Like if they're, if they're getting paid 25%, they're not going to teach you how to fucking find a way out of that. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? What would that do for them? Right. Let me, so, let me empower you to get out of the thing I put you in. They're not going to teach you how to do that. No. So for my manager to teach me everything that's going on right now, that was like the first, like, whoa, no. that brought light to me. I was like, damn, like, yo, he's a real dude. Like that's a, that's a real motherfucker right there. He knows what he's talking about. Like he's looking at, at it from my best interest. Plus the contract was too good not to sign. Like yeah. it was this e easy one page and, and it benefits us both. We're both getting paid a ton of money. Um, well, and, there, and there's so, an opportunity, right? If you had said yes to certain things that were not favorable, you wouldn't necessarily have had this opportunity. Exactly. You know? Now, if I, if I had never met him, I would still be stuck on a contract with, with Peter. I'm not going to lie. I would be stuck on a contract with him because that's, that's what kind of person I was dealing with. He, he wasn't going to let me go because I wanted to get let go. He, he let go because he realized he was bringing a knife to a gunfight and that gunfight was going to open up a whole can of worms that he definitely didn't want to deal with. It was going to cost him a lot more money yeah. and, 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 and lawyers and all that. And I mean, my, my manager's net worth speaks for itself. <laughs> that wouldn't have been a hard fight for us. Uh, let's be like, let's, let's put it like that. Um, we're, we're here to win, man. That's what it comes down to. I'm not here to be a professional opponent. So that anytime, like if you go on my, if you can type it in right now, if you want, you can go on harryjigliotti.com and you can read in the section there right at the bottom. It says we are a side or 50, 50 draws. We are not professional opponents. So don't call me with some bullshit going, Hey, I'll pay you 6,000 to come fight fucking blah, blah, blah. Right. You want to fight Jamel Charlo for eight grand? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right. Dude, people people will be like, yeah, no problem. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, yeah. you're even if you win, you're not going to – it's going to be a split draw or a split decision. 
They're not going right. to give you the win. But like, even if you win, they're going to make it about what an off night he had. Yeah, they yeah. So yeah. off tonight. They, they aren't. They aren't selling you, bro. You're the B yeah. side. Like nah. I, I realized it when I was with Dave Zone when I fought a Ponte. They were like putting him on and 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 commentating and, and talking to him and interviewing him. And I'm like sitting there in like the logistics room waiting to get interviewed. And when they never called me, I was like, damn, bro, this is not good. <laughs> I was like, fuck. Nah, well, I realized real. like, I that shit like, is real. Damn. I was talking to Mike Guy and he was telling me about like you show up in another guy's hometown and you're not on the A-side promoter, and nobody fucking says hi to you, and the other guy's saying what's up to the judges, and the fucking, it's, it, it's all, it all just looks like exactly what the fuck it is, you know? They're like, you'll know it by the announcement, like, Harry the Hitman, Jiggler, and they're like, from Ohio Lair, he is the Miami yeah. boy! And I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, it's like you're I'm at like, a Knicks game, hey, and they're fucking, they're announcing, like, they announce the like, team first. <laughs> At, at, at some point, I'm like, do I bite down on my mouth guard and just start swinging? <laughs> like, what do I do here? I'm yeah. like, I mean, obviously, I'm like, I know I'm not getting knocked out. I have a great chin. But it's like, I don't want to lose. Like, I, I'm not here to fucking lose. So when people are like, you know, he's not here to lay down. It's like Chris L. Jerry said that either. he's not here to lay down. It's like, well, no shit. It's very clear I'm not here to lay down. I'm fucking trying to knock him. I'm trying to right. give him everything I got here. I got outscored in that fight. I wasn't going to win that fight regardless. I lost. I'll admit that. That's the only fight debatably like 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 Bang Williams and Chris Jacobs majority decision split decision. Debatably people were like, yeah, I thought Harry won that. Aponte people were like, you got outworked. He was the oh. taller guy. I could barely touch him. I didn't even start landing really anything until the 4th round. I found out that day four rounds is not my fight. I'm a deep water fighter. Yeah. I know how to weather the yeah. storm, and I can fucking outwork you in the later rounds. It's like the Higgins four round. Your best round was the fifth round. You know. Oh, I mean? dude, I started. Yeah, that's where I that was started. Your best round of the fight. Pace. Yeah, yeah. He he started making a little comeback with the momentum shift in the third round, and I I he gave it right rounds. back to him though. He yeah, yeah, yeah. I I had it. Now people will say, you know, five three. I think it was six two. I think five three or six two. It's appropriate for that fight. Yeah, yeah, but it was very clear that I, I, I was pumping like, like oh. at times the commentary. You were landing like, the head snappers. You were landing. Dude, the it was, snappers. it was getting like, and then when he would step in, I was timing that uppercut left hook every time too. Like people, yep. people, people don't realize it. They're like, well, the banger. He was like, oh, bang and Harry. It's like, dude, I, I had way more higher punch count. I was controlling the ring with my distance. That's it's what you got to look at. People, it it's easy for people when, when somebody's ha- is moving forward. You know what yeah, I'm of course. The People aggressor. The of the yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, how clean the work is. You know what I'm saying? But, but in that sense, Willie Pep, Floyd Mayweather, Muhammad Ali, Oscar De La Hoya, a yeah. lot of those guys got on their bicycle and moved and pumped off the jab and controlled the distance that way. Right. They they could bang a little bit. I can bang a little bit too. But I'm not there to – I want to not get hit. I, I'm trying yeah. to box. I'm trying to work here, man. So I feel like a lot of these people are just there to see – like a, a, a slug match, which if that's the case, they're going to love triad combat because triad <laughs> combat is not a boxing match. It's not. It's a, it's made for that like that old fashioned. That was a phenomenal plug. Oh, hell yeah. That was a good plug <laughs> you just said right there. I mean, dude, it's true. Like yeah. you want to see Rocky Marciano style fights back in the day, you go over to triad combat. Yeah. That's it. So switching gears just good, a really? little bit, just a little bit of a gear switch. Did you get to see Taylor versus Catterall? Um, Taylor versus Catterall. I did not know. Josh Taylor and Josh I, So listen, I, I heard that it was a robbery. You know, look, I, I again, I watched it on my phone. So anytime I watch a fight on my phone, I like preface it with it's not the best view of it. But dude, I saw some no. highlights on Instagram. I heard it was a close fight. I heard that um, well, Josh Taylor is the A side. Come on. I mean, the big time. They want to keep him as champion. Um, but I heard he got outworked. I heard it could have I could have went either way. And in, in, in that type of fight, it's a perfect example of it's not a 50-50. That's an A side, B side fight. Um, if it was 50-50 and there was a lot on the line, like I think I think the same thing would have been like. 
okay, sure, you can make Mario Barrios the 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 A side in that fight, but they're trying to make the comeback of Keith Thurman. That's what we're trying yeah. to sell it as. Now Keith gave a boxing clinic to to Mario, yep. but if it was the other way around, would they have gave the decision to Mario? Probably not. They probably would have put it as a draw to give Keith that leverage and to give him that, okay, well, he can still come back. He can still make a comeback here. Um, because how they were selling it is they were promoting him. You know what I mean? That's what it seemed like. Josh Taylor fights a lot of people. Like he's down to fight people and he's got good resume. And I think, I think he deserves to be the champion. With that said, when I read a whole list of comments saying that he got, that there was a, a highway robbery, well then, I'm going to have to go by that. I haven't seen the fight. I'm not a big Josh Taylor fan. I actually, I know a kid that got a call to fight him at one point over here in New England, uh, Michael Ohan. Um, he didn't take the fight, um, which, I mean, Mike uh, Mike is a great boxer. That would have been a tough fight to win. Plus, he would have been a B-side. Yeah, I mean, that's just how it is. I'm pretty sure Josh Taylor has had a fight over here, I think, in uh, the Mohegan Sun. A couple times. He fights in that fight was in England, right? Yeah, uh, no, it was in Scotland. I was in Scotland. Well, which is part of why he was the A side, right? Was because he's from Scotland well, and Catterall's from England. So it was Cat right. going to his hometown, which I think it was part of why Taylor was fighting a little bit tight, was because it was, you know, the pressure of being the hometown of hometown boy and your undisputed champ and all that. And then on top of that, Catterall was boxing beautiful off the back foot. The I had no he, idea. I had no idea he beat Regis Progress in a majority decision. Oh, Regis yeah. Progress is – so Regis Pro, – fun fact, Regis Progress's coach was my cut man uh, for the triad. No shit. Yeah, good dude. Bro, I that was a great name. fight. If you haven't gotten to watch that fight, it, it, that's that was part of why – where I was like sold on, on Josh Taylor because I thought Progress was going to win that fight. And it was it was a flip a coin fight that I think Taylor like just edged. Yeah, yeah. I've seen Reg. I saw Regis um, progress fight Ivan. And I saw that that body shot that he went. It was actually that was on the Mike Tyson uh, Roy Jones. Um, that was a good fight. I thought Ivan uh, faked the fucking. He said it was like a low blow or whatever. It was like right on the hip. Um, but yeah, I I I mean, it just goes to show Josh Taylor's fought in a lot of people. He's yeah. he's real deal. Yeah. But that's where, um, for me, so I thought at the end of the fight, Catterall kind of took his foot off the gas, to be honest with you. And he, it's not that, I, I just felt like he, he started to coast a little bit. He was like, all right, I got this in the bag. But Taylor kept coming forward. He kept kind of pressing him. And he wasn't landing a lot clean, but he was just kind of out hustling him. And I felt yeah. like, so I, I, I actually, I scored the fight on box rec. And I think I had it 113 to 112 for Catterall. But I, it would right. be it was I, the the calling this one a robbery, bro. I'm always fucking calling out judging, bro. I'm always yeah. calling out bad judging because it, it happens all the fucking time. I'm just not sure this is the one where it's like. But maybe I'm. Well, they have a, I need to watch it on a bigger screen. So they they have a couple different things to try and uh, like Logan Paul made a good. Uh, he made a tweet uh, two day three days ago about um, the judging. He thinks there should be. First off, there should be two judges to all sides of the ring, all four corners, um, because it needs to come to an agreement. Also, some people believe there needs to be sensors in the gloves where you can uh, calculate the impact and the power and how many punches have been thrown between the left hand and the right hand. Um, but at that point, that's like almost like an amateur scored fight, like like the click, 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 the, the punch count. Um, these things could all play a good role, but... The thing is, is that the way they do it with three three judges and each, and there's only three judges and, and, and they're all watching a different fight. You know what I mean? It doesn't make it doesn't make much sense on how they do the scoring. But I feel like because of how corrupt boxing is, it almost benefits how they want to score the fight, regardless. You know what I mean? So are they going to change that? I don't know. But how, what Jake Paul said kind of made sense. Um, More judges. It, more judges, dude. You need to be able to see it from a from a different standpoint, and you need to have someone disagree to agree. So yeah. it's like, okay, okay. If these, if the out of out of the out of the eight judges, um, 
out of the eight judges, if two of them are agreeing on this side and two of them are agreeing on this side and all the others are disagreeing, well, you're going to put it together that the, the four that agreed and more likely is it's probably that is the scorecard. It's the, it's the, it's the, the higher of the odds. You know what I mean? Um, it just makes more sense. Well, and I always like to look at when I go on box rec, I'll look at, they have like the scoring section and they'll show like the average fan score and it'll show how many different people have scored the fight. And a lot of times, depending on the fight, it'll be a hundred, 200 people that have scored one. Did fight. any? Well, yeah, that's how, that's how I go on um, tapology tapology. You can, you can vote and stuff. Um, and it's kind of funny. People had like Higgins, like, 78 percent beating me and like i think 25 had him knocking me out it's fucking ridiculous when have i ever been knocked out of my career you know what i mean like yeah. what 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 are we what are you what are you basing these results off is uh, what i'm trying to say i feel like people are critics you know what i mean people like to people like to pitch their their opinion which is is it, it, i think boxing it's beautiful for the sport to be able to do that um have these pages where you can kind of put a sense of uh your review in on what you, how you look at the fight and how you kind of see it. Um, but I feel like, like I said, you go in the comment section and more people are saying that, you know, uh, what's his name? Kintar. They're saying that he got robbed. I feel like you can kind of put that into, you know, retrospect and be like, okay, maybe he did get robbed. I haven't seen the highlights, so I can't tell you. I have seen certain videos. It looked like he was outscoring uh, Josh Taylor from some of the views I was seeing it from. He uh, no, and he absolutely was. He he landed the cleaner shots. He, but the thing was there that there wasn't a variety in his offense. There was the looping left hand. It was the straight left hand. It was off, the, and it was working. He was making it work. I'm not saying he wasn't. It was just was Josh was Josh fighting out. He, he he was trying to fight from the outside the whole fight, right? No, it was weird. He was trying to press the whole time, and he was like trying to make the fight, and he was just walking into the same shot over and over and over again. I was just yeah. like, how is he not adjusting to this? Because it's making the like, adjustments. Yeah, he's falling in with his jab. He's getting clipped with the same fucking left hand, and then they clinch. Right. And it was just like right. that for like eight rounds. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You you think he would make the adjustments and see it, or his coach would at least see it from from the, from the uh, the corner and be like, whoa whoa whoa, buddy, you keep walking in one dimensionally and you're getting caught with the same punch. That's where yeah. I start to wonder if it's if it's weight on some level because when you start having to cut weight and and he's you know he's five eleven or whatever, making but yeah, you, pounds. you slow you slow up, man. When the more weight you have to cut, people slow. People say it's even worse when you try to go up in weight. They're like, well, you're, when you're used to holding, when you're not used to holding all that weight, it's fucking exhausting. More muscle, like yeah. someone like Brandon Higgins, muscle mass is great in boxing when you can knock someone out. But if you don't put someone out in the later rounds, all those muscles need oxygen. So yeah. they're all, they're looking they're looking for the blood. You got to think about the problem blood flow, that Anthony Joshua has. Dude, he's he's lifting too many weights. The same thing with Deontay Wilder. He lifts yeah. way too many weights. These guys don't need they don't understand that this is more cardio based aerobics if anything if you're going to do anything explosive aerobics like like punching with weights like 10 out like i when when we were doing camp like we were doing uh, a lot of the machines and stuff and we were doing like a minute of explosiveness with low weight like you don't need to do 45 to 80 pounds of weight man that, that's first off it's wear and tear on your body um like that's good for the sense of if, if you're a bodybuilder sure well yeah that's right. what they do. But if you're not, if you're, if you're looking for explosiveness, then you're better off doing lighter weights and um, doing more aerobics with it. You know what I mean? Like getting the heart rate up, slowing it down, getting the heart rate up, slowing it down uh, at like a faster, more explosive rate. Like jumping rope, jump roping is great. It's great in all sense for cardio, for aerobics, to get the heart rate up, to slow it down. You know what I mean? That 30 second bell, you go as hard as you can get the heart rate up. Then you get the minute break where you slow it down. It's, um, it's like a lot of the basics can win you the fight. It's just um, like like the camp I was just in with Lennox and them. They don't believe in pad work. They don't do pads. Really? They believe in they believe in sparring. They believe cardio and a little bit of bag work. And they don't do hard bag work, bag work either. They're not over fucking throwing punches and like banging the bag. They're making it look pretty and they're finding their shots, finding a rhythm. Um, there's no sense in uh and the way like Mayweather does his pads, 
it, it's all pretty. It's all pretty. It's not going to work in the fight. Maybe a little bit with the catching and stuff, but but more as it it, it looks good. It just looks good. I think People that's designed for that kind of work is designed for reflexes. It's not necessarily yeah, it's, like I'm going to do this but, exact movement. But and- you can you can get you're better off doing a speed bag, cobra bag, or or double end at that point. Right. Pads pads. I when I do pads, I use my jab. I use my reach. I'm trying to find out how how to control distance. You know what I mean? Things I like that. It helps okay. with like transition offense to defense work without sparring. Well, you know what I mean? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're not taking the damage. Exactly. Um, um, yeah, I, I there, there is a lot of benefits of it. I believe pad work is good. But dude, when I heard that, I heard I heard their standpoint on it. And it made sense. Sure. It's like, no, we do it to warm up to get the heart rate going and like get the sweat. But they're like, we don't do it like in our camp. Like we don't, we don't, we rarely do it. Once in a while they'll do it light, but like they don't look at it as something that benefits you uh in camp. They don't they think sparring's the biggest thing. First off, I guess James Tony only sparred. He would go run a little bit and then get right in the spar. Never really jumped rope, never hit the bag. He was like known for running and sparring, running and sparring every day, which that's not good for your brain. But I mean, I know people that spar to get in shape. Like they're like strictly like, yeah, I'm going to spar today. I'm going to spar tomorrow. It's probably the next couple of days until I can get my pace. And then I'll like, you know, I'll get my runs in. I'll hit the bag a little bit, jump a little rope. But the main thing that primary focus is, is like, I'm going to spar like 10 rounds today. And it's like, whoa, bro. But that adds up on your brain, bro. Like sure. you're going to get hit. Yeah. You're going to get hit. Um, I don't know. It's just weird to see how people uh, do their camp and shit. Um, that was one of the best camps I've ever been in, by the way. Yeah, talk I, to I, me about I've done, Lennox Lewis, man. Talk to me about Lennox Lewis and what that, what that, the, uh, like the last undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Uh, I, I, I love the guy. I, I grew to like a lot of those guys. Stephen Hayden's their strength coach. Uh, Zolt Durrani is the real deal. Zolt is coming up in the game, had a minor slip up. Uh, he lost to Benjamin Whitaker in a majority decision, but. He, 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 I hate to, I hate to tell his story. It's made for him, but he had a loss in his family. He lost his baby sister. And, um, and, 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 and he said that that was partially it. Like he shouldn't have took the fight on such low on, uh, on such last minute notice, uh, especially with, with the death in his family and stuff. It was a lot behind it. And his wife was pregnant with their kid. Um, it's just a lot of things that played in mentally where he said that he shouldn't have took the fight. Um, with that said, the comeback of Zoltarani is going to be real deal. That kid's coming up, and that kid's uh, four-time Hung- uh, four-time Canadian champ, two-time Hungarian, a lot of national pedigree. Beat Abraham Supernova back in the amateurs. Um, Lennox has got a good guy, man. Lennox has got a real good guy under his belt. Um, they I, they have a lot of hope for them, and uh, I, I learned to love that team. Lennox is an intellectual, knowledgeable guy. He has a lot of uh, he feeds you a lot of brain food. He 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 gives you a lot of food for thought. Um, the guy is just a gentleman, hands down. I have nothing nothing bad to say about anybody in that camp. All those guys were um, they're like family. They're great. What I can't wait best, to get what the, was the best uh, knowledge nugget that Lennox dropped on you. Uh, biomechanics. Once you learn the biomechanics of the sport, the rhythm of letting the jab get its full reach. And then getting it back to time off the right hand. Biomechanics is the biggest science of the sport. A lot of people say it's the the a lot of people are like, no, you gotta know your dynamics, you gotta know your angles. No, bro, you wanna be able to get full reach on your jab. So you're not taking that half step in and getting caught. Because the reason of boxing is to hit and not get hit. So once you find the full extension of your reach, you can use that to your benefit all day. That was one of the things he said is you need to be able to know how to control the distance and use your leverage as the best of your ability. If you're taking a half step in and your arms like this and you're not fully extending, then you're not getting the full power that you need to, to throw the punch and land. And, and, and on top of that, you're not, you're not establishing dominance. You're not letting that jab out with the full power that it, it deserves. You, you hit someone with a straight fucking stiff jab at the full power, the full leverage, the full reach. Dude, that shit stings. Yep. He basically saying is the biomechanics of the sport is one of the biggest factors. People look for the angles. The angles play a role. You've got to know your angles. Got to know how to step around the ring and move. And you got to know uh, you got to know your angles. You got to be able to move 
whether you're going to go left, or you're going to go right. You're going to be able to cut the ring off. You're going to be able to know how to do these things because sometimes you're going to fight different styles. The runners, I like to run a little bit. You're going to have to cut them off. Uh, you're going to fight more of a traditional boxer. You're going to learn how to get inside and work the body to get to the head, kind of like the Mike Tyson, get low, peekaboo style, touch the body, touch the head, Mickey Ward, guys like that that had to kind of use that to their benefit. These are all tactics and biomechanics, using your leverage, things like that, full extension of the jab. Um, he was such a great guy, man. I, I, I really, I, I missed the whole team over there. I can't wait till they give me a call to do camp again, because, uh, Toronto became like a second home to me. And, and we've had talks of, um, cause I'm planning on moving to Hollywood beach at some point this year. Um, we've had talks about maybe doing a camp in Miami. I mean, they got a ton of guys in Miami from Bang Williams to Xander Zayas to, Aaron Aponte, uh, Erickson Lubin, a lot of work over there, a lot of top-notch prospect fighters. Um, so this is where I want to be, man. The, I'm surrounded by greatness. I want to continue that. Ever since my new management, I've had nothing but ups. You know what I mean? There's no downfall. There's nothing playing a role in my career where I'm like scratching my head going, is this worth it? You know what I mean? Like, so I just can't wait to see the next chapter of my career right now. I'm trying to see, you know, with whether it's triad or whether it's boxing, there's just, um, and I've invited them. I was like, Steven, Steven Hayden and them, they're like best friends, him and Lennox. Um, I was like, would you want to corner me? Cause they were, Lennox wrestled back in high school. He was a good wrestler. Uh, and Steven Hayden was, uh, was much better. Obviously that was more of his style, but, um, they both have a lot of knowledge through boxing and wrestling, which is going to play a huge role in clinching. And um and this triad. So I kind of want to have them around for that camp. I I uh I've been in talks with Steve about maybe being in my corner and working with me on some things. So I think you'll see a lot more of uh of uh Zoltarini's camp working with Team Hitman, which will be a, a cool clash and a and a and a good collab. I'm uh, I'm excited to see where we can go with that. Yeah, that's cool with shit, bro. Um, I guess last last topic before I let you go. Was the other night also your first night doing commentary? I was talking about this with Gabe the other day. Yeah, my very first time. Yeah. It wasn't my first time being on camera, but it was my first time, yeah, being being um being there to commentate the break break by break fight. Um it was tough kind of honestly to find like the 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 fluent um motion of being able to, you know, speak uh, play by play on the fights, but I knew a lot of the fighters like Luke and them. Like that was a really easy one to do. I could have done Eric Goff because I know Eric Goff's uh, amateur career a little bit better. And I mean Alejandro Paulino and James Manor I know pretty well as well. Um, but the well, guys that I didn't know, Harden. no, and you you were really good at, at at playing it off like you knew everything, which was really good. I actually saw that it was more natural for you. Um, but I mean, like I said, you have a lot of experience with being there to, you know, interview fighters and, and kind of get a piece on who they are and, and get to know them. So, you know, with that, to your credit, I feel like it wasn't your first, uh, you know, first, first game in the park. I was basing it off your, your, uh, like every time you took like a play by play, I kind of worked off it. You know what I mean? It was kind of cool, but, uh, I think the most exciting, uh, fight of the night was the knockout. No one expected that. I mean, um, I'm going to look that guy's a, name up real quick, actually, because that, that's actually worth. I think it's Joseph Fernandez. Um, Joseph Fernandez. Yeah, that was it. Wait, hold on one sec. I'm on box rec right now. Yeah, Joseph Joseph Fernandez getting stopped by Gonzalo Carlos Diera, who was <laughs> 15. I'm looking right now. Gonzalo Diera. That guy... By the I've way, by the way, that. by the way, nine and fifteen has been stopped fourteen times. So that's what a, I, a real good win that is, dude. That was the most memorable moment I think of the night for me. Hundred um, percent. And then Luke's debut. Uh, Luke, Luke is a good friend of mine in the gym. So seeing him um, with with a large crowd behind him and and all that, you see where the hard work paid off. Um, and I think that was really cool all around to to, to see. Um, the rise of Luke Linicelli, especially um, in his professional debut. Um, and there's going to be a lot more things coming from him and, and, and Gabriel. Gabriel Morales is a brother of mine, too. I, I've been working with him since uh, 2018. 
And uh, he's been in a lot of my camps and he's been through a lot of uh, seen a lot of things that I've went through with, with promoters and stuff. And, um, you know, he was there for a lot of that in my career. So I count him as like a brother, brother of mine for sure. And uh, a lot of big things coming for Gabe. I think, you know, if I, if, when I get the, when I get the foot in the door with Triller, I'd, I'd love to see him in a triad fight or, or maybe a Triller fight as like a good A side 50, 50 draw. Cause you know, he's the real deal. I went 10 rounds with them last night and he's, uh, he's not playing around. He's here to win. So, I mean, you know, the sky is the limit for a lot of these guys in new England right now. And, uh, you know, I could see him f- making some upsets too, like maybe a fight against like Johnny DePina or Eric Goff. And those are big fun fights to see down the line as well. So, you know, sky is a limit for him though. He's got a lot of opportunities. So, I mean, he's got the knockout of the year for new England this year. Right. So Boston boxing gave him the knockout <laughs> of the year. Um, he knocked out cam Arnold, uh, a five and oh M- MMA champion over in NEF. Um, I mean, no one expected him to at least sleep the kid like that. The way he slept him was fucking dominant fashion. Yep. For a, for, a, for a little dude, he's got a lot of explosiveness. So, you know, I, I can't wait to see the rise in uh, Gabby. Can't wait to see what he's what he's got next in his career as well. Yeah, and it's it's wild. Both, both of you guys, you know, being relatively seasoned as fighters, not – you know, he didn't have a really long amateur career. I don't know how long yours was, but he was telling me he had like nine fights or something before. He, he was the up, central. You know? He was the central New England champion. He has fought in a couple nationally ranked kids. Uh, Jadel Pazamino. Jadel beat him in a split decision. The fight could have went either way. I thought Gabby didn't dig deep like he should have. Um but Gabby didn't even know he had that fight coming up. He was in Puerto Rico the week before that. You know what I mean? Like those are things like he thought he won the whole golden gloves. He had the regionals he had to get through next. Um, so it was just like a little minor slip up in his career. Um, but I mean, to go a split decision against a kid that's nationally seasoned and has pedigree, that's out, that's outstanding. So, I mean, the sky is the fucking limit for the kid. I can't wait to see what's going to be next in both of our careers. Plus Luke and, um, a couple other guys in New England that that you know we witnessed that night. I think James Manor has a pretty good bright future ahead of him. Also, someone there that was supposed to be in the next card, Victor Reynoso. Uh, Victor right, is a I'm very good friend of mine. Victor was in camp with me and Zoltarini. Um, the kid has a lot of pedigree, has been an Olympic trialist. Uh, I think the two Olympic trials has won a nationals back in the day, fought been fighting since he was 12 years old. Um you know, he's seen everything. He's had a lot of amateur fights. The, the kid is 7-0 and right now. And, you know, another one that, you know, can go anywhere in the sport. He had a, another one that kind of dealt with a promoter that kind of used and abused him. And you hate to see that, especially with someone with so much talent. I hope and I, I, I pray that he gets a good fight that benefits him and gets signed to some big promotion because he deserves it. He's a gentleman, a good kid, and a scholar, very, very uh, smart intellectual. Um, there's so much talent, dude. You don't want to see it get fucking used and abused. You know what I mean? Especially in this sport. Um, the sky's the limit, though, man. Especially from people that don't have talent, that exploit people with talent. You know what I mean? Without the fighters, they're nothing. Exactly. These guys aren't – they're not going anywhere without without the fighters. Bro, and it's the same in the no. in the music industry. I've been making music for years. I've, there's been times where I've opened for bigger artists, and they exploit me by making me sell tickets, and then they take all the money, but I get, like, $5 on top after the 50th ticket or no whatever. No shit. You know, like, no shit. It's all the same shit. You know what I mean? It's the same structure. The music, The music industry – is a bigger shark tank than boxers. The only thing is the boxers get punched. So that's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like we're getting fucking punched in the head here, bro. Yeah. there's I'm losing brain cells. People die every year in boxing. People die every year. There's a lot. There's a lot of, of high risk for low reward. What that said in the music industry is they'll sell your label and make money off you. And you'll walk away with nothing like that. That happens all the time. Yeah. It's it's very similar. The entertainment industry is one big shark tank. It's yeah. literally just one big shark tank. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
And it's basically us against the producers and promoters. Right. That's it. It's like, we got to stick together here because at the end of the day, we're the one making them money. They don't fuck. They don't give a rat's ass. If you fucking decide you want to fucking retire tomorrow, they don't give a shit. They'll go find another kid that, that, that they think can market and sell tickets and and make money for them. Regardless, they're going to have another kid come out of the amateurs this year. They're already looking who they can see in the golden gloves because they already know what they want. Right, The wheels are always turning. They don't ever stop turning. It doesn't stop. So, right. and father time's always ticking. So they tell you to get your fucking money and get the fuck out. I'm 26 now. I see my career going until I'm about 34, 35. That gives me a couple good years of fighting. If Triller Triad pays out more than boxing, you bet your fucking ass I'll never look back at boxing again. Like I said, I love boxing. It's a piece of me. It's a part of my family. I rock my golden glove on me. I fought in two golden gloves. I was a semifinalist. Um, I, I will never, ever, ever stop loving boxing. My cousin died in the – well, he didn't die in the sport, but he died with the sport. That, that was a piece that – when we laid him to rest, he died with his New England belt. We put that in his casket with him. So I will never, ever stop loving this sport. But I'm a prize fighter. So I'm going to go where the money takes me. As long as it's not bare knuckle boxing, I'm down for it. Because <laughs> bare knuckles a little, I still want to sell things like commercial and maybe get into the movie industry <laughs> down the line. And right. I, I don't want my eyes all fucking caved up and my knuckles all fucked. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, so there's a lot of things after boxing that I got, you know, that, that we're setting up right now. Like right now it's in talks. Um, we might have William Shatner who was Captain Kirk in Star Trek there walking you. me out for my next fight. Yeah. So if that, I mean, that guy is almost a billionaire. If a guy <laughs> like that is walking me out and you don't tell me I'm not marketable, you can get the fuck out of here. You know what I mean? Like I'm here, I'm here to be a big time a side. I'm going to be a champion. I want to do all that, whether it's in the boxing ring or in the triad, one way or another, I'm going to find greatness. I'm going to find, you know, where I want to be as a professional. And, um, you know, it's all in good, it's all, all in good hope and in good pace. You know what I mean? I'm not going to overstep and I'm not going to try to jump right in right now and, and claim I'm something I'm not, I still got a lot of building to do here, but, um, I see myself being a world champion in the triad and I see myself being, you know, greatness. I see myself being a hall of famer. If that is, you know, ever to be a thing in, in, in triad, if it ever gets to that world level, I, I want to be the first pioneer to be the one that won the world title and had that shit wrapped around my fucking waist. So. Well, Harry, I'm looking forward to seeing all of it. My friend, is there anything else or anyone else you want to shout out before we call it? Um, shout out law town boxing, Gene Baraldi, um, Sonny's boxing glove, uh, boxing club, Danny Oliver, all the guys down there. Um, I want to give a shout out to my brother, my papa, who's 90 years old, the first ever in the family to create the history of boxing and in the uh, four generations that he's created. Um, my mom, my dad, and you know, every, my girlfriend, Juliana, I love you guys. And uh, everything I do is for you. So a lot of uh, things to look forward to. And um, I hope you guys all stay in tune. Well, bro, keep me in the loop. Let me know what's going on. You know what I'm saying? I hope we get to commentate fights again someday. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Let's do this again sometime. Yeah, stay in touch with me, brother. And uh, if I ever get a uh, – me and Gabby have been talking. Maybe we'll do it. If I get a fight out – um, because I almost had a couple at the Barclay. If I get a fight out there, um, I'm going to see what I can do, let alone with you commentating. But um, I'm also going to be out there in the area, so we'll we'll get some lunch or some shit. And uh, we'll start talking about maybe doing a podcast face to face in front of some people. Hell yeah, yeah. for sure. Stay in touch, brother. I'm checking out. I'll talk to you. All right. Peace, Peace brother.